All right, enough of all that socializing. Come on in. No more talking. Fun's over. Time for church. Thanks, I actually got them all cut. Yeah. All right. Well, good morning, church. How are you? Good, good, good. Good, good. Come on in out of that foyer. It's church time. I'm the, see, our other service host, it was supposed to be Alyssa today, and she had a sick kid last night, so she couldn't be here. And that is a bummer for you, because she's much nicer than I am. I'm just like, stop all that gabbing. Get in here. It's church time. So, and yeah. Now, we'll have time to visit again in just a minute here. I got to make a couple of announcements, or at least one announcement, and that is this Friday is our youth um, spaghetti night. So, drive through spaghetti night. So, not like we're going to make you drive through spaghetti. <laughs> just come speeding through and we'll just fling it at you. <laughs> Whatever steaks you can keep. So, and we're only going to charge you $8 a ticket for that. So today is your last day to buy tickets for the youth spaghetti feed. And um, you can see Jackie or one of the youth around here. Jackie back there, she's at the computer this morning. So you can see her after service. Get a ticket for the youth spaghetti feed. And then... Uh, my plan, and I know some others' plans, are that we're going to bring a lawn chair with us. So I'm actually going to, after I get my spaghetti, I'm going to be sitting right back out here at our old outdoor worship area, and we're going to be having some food together. So if you want to hang out too, bring a lawn chair with you, and you can hang out. We'll all chat it up, because I know how much you all like to do that. <laughs> bring an instrument. Oh my goodness, this might turn into a worship time out there too. So yeah, we could do that. We could do that. So let's go ahead and stand this morning and get ready to worship and get into the word. Before we do that, we'll take a few minutes to meet and greet in case you hadn't done enough of that. We'll have a little little section of that again, but let's just let's just prepare our hearts to be in the presence of Jesus. Amen. God, there is no one like you. There is nothing like being in your presence, Lord. And we just thank you, God, that, of course, you are in our hearts, but, God, I believe you are in this place. And, God, I believe you desire to meet with your church this morning. Lord, whether they're here in person, whether they're watching online in their living rooms or, or wherever they're at right now, God, we know you desire to meet with your people today, Lord. So, God, we pray that you would inhabit the praises of your people today, God. We worship you, Lord. We worship you, Jesus. You are so good to us. Be blessed by our praise today, Lord, and we are just confident that we will leave here changed and refreshed and empowered in the Spirit. We thank you for this, Lord, in your mighty name. Amen. Okay, take a few minutes, church. Say hi to one another, and then we'll get into worship. Good morning, Connection Church. If you all could find your seat and uh, stand up, please. We're going to join in worship together. I just want to start us off with some prayer. And so if you guys would bow your heads with me and pray, I'll just start. <laughs> Father, thank you. Thank you so much for gathering us here, God. I pray that you just bless our time together. And I pray that you would just um, you, you would open our hearts to what you want to do in us today, God. I pray that you would just fill us with joy, that peace that surpasses understanding. I pray that you would just ignite in us that passion for you, God. I pray that you would just unite us all in you, God. We're one body. I pray, God, that you would just encourage each one of us, too, that we would be edified through this worship, God, and that we'd be lifted up. Our soul would rejoice in what you've done for us, God. Remind us of what you've done for us. 
I pray that you would just speak through this worship, God, in today's service. And I pray that you just open our hearts to what you want to do today. In your mighty name, amen. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he is my song. Again. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he is my song, and you are good. You're good, oh, and you are good, you're good, oh, let the king of my heart be the wind inside my sails, the anchor in the waves, oh, he is my song, let the king of my heart be the fire inside my veins, the echo of my days. Oh, he is my song, and you are good, you're good. Oh, and you are good, you're good. confess 
I'm bowing here, I find my rest, and without you, I fall apart, you're the one that guides my heart, Lord, I need So at this time, uh, we want to invite our prayer team to come on up to the front and be prepared. Um, and I want to share with you guys something that happened to me that never happens, never in my whole life. But um, I had a dream last night, and in that dream, I saw words, and they were a scripture. First time 
that ever happened to me, and it was delight yourself in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. And I've obviously heard this scripture before. It's, it's you know, helped me in seasons of my life, but I thought it was important to share with you this morning. I shared it at the other campus, and uh, it really touched someone and confirmed something that was happening in their life. And I wanted to remind you this morning that when you delight yourself in the Lord, he not only gives you new desires, fresh desires, desires that are of him, but he also nurtures the ones that he already placed there. He tends to those things because he is faithful. So if he placed something in there, he comes back to it and he calls to it and he, he makes sure that it flourishes if you're open to it. So I want to remind you guys this morning that, um, that this body is filled with people who are at different phases in their walk with God. And you may be a seasoned believer and your experience tells you that you just prayed this morning and you don't need any extra help. But maybe that's not true. Maybe open yourself up to the experience of being prayed with and being prayed over. Or open yourself up to think of someone in your life who can't be here this morning, who needs that prayer, and you are here for that purpose. You're here to be that door for them. Also, if you're scared, because there are so many people that that first time that you have to step out and be vulnerable, that it's terrifying to think that you have to expose yourself in that way. But this is a safe place. This is a place where God heals and he works miracles and he does powerful, powerful things. And he does it by using each and every one of us. So it is okay to break down in front of your brother or your sister and let them help build you back up. It's also okay just to ask God to give you a dream or a vision for what your future, a passion and a purpose. Because if you don't have something that's setting you on fire right now, it's okay to be open to what that looks like in the future. So I just want to encourage each and every one of you that if there is anything stirring in your heart, if there is even the tiniest little motion, don't silence it. Don't quiet that voice, but instead listen to it. Let it lead you to the place where God will speak to you and move through you. Hey, um, I just want to assure you of this, too, because I know we had a few people up here to pray, and it looks like now they're praying with people. But if you need prayer, just come forward, and we have elders in this church, people who know how to pray, who they're going to gather around you. So if it looks like it's full, 
it's not full, okay? We want to pray for you this morning. We want you to just have such an encounter with the Holy Spirit this morning. So if you need prayer, do not hesitate. You come forward, somebody's going to pray for you this morning. Amen? Amen.
Become 
Father, we thank you. We thank you so much. You know, I'm just thinking about what this song says. It says, let us become more aware of your presence. Father, if there is anyone in here right now who is not intimately aware of your presence in this place, God, I pray that that would change in this moment, Lord. We thank you, Father, for meeting us here. We thank you, Lord, for your presence. God, you are so good. You are so good to us. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. You may be seated, church. Praise the Lord. Thank you, worship team. Thank you for leading us in worship. But also, I just want to thank you for for hearing from the Lord on your songs that you chose this morning. You know, I um, I had a a message planned for today. And really, I'm not the guy who is like, you know, and then last minute, God changed it. You know, I don't usually do that a lot. And yet yesterday, when I was preparing, there just kept being this check in my spirit about what I was going to teach. And um, and I switched the message up to something that I've called the power of presence, the power of presence. And then like every worship song we've done today has just been about being in the presence of God. But it is the presence of God that changes everything, everything. And I just want to take a few minutes to share about that this morning. We're still going to be in 1 Samuel. We're actually going to pull up a verse or a section of verses that I used a few weeks ago, starting in verse 11 of 1 Samuel chapter 16. And we're back at that spot where King Saul now has been rejected of the Lord, and Samuel has been sent to the house of Jesse to identify who will be the next king and to anoint that person as king. And and they have been parading out now. Jesse has been parading out his sons one after another in front of Samuel. And you had the big, strong, likely candidate in Eliab who, you know, just one look at him, you would think this has to be the guy who's going to be king. And even Samuel thought, surely this must be the guy. But it's not because the Lord looks at the heart, right? Um, Saul was the desire of their heart, and he had the, of the people's heart, and he had the looks of a king. He had the stature and everything of a king. He was head and shoulders above everyone. God was interested in the heart now. So we pick it up in verse 11. It says, he, they said, um, we still have one left. He's out in the field tending sheep. So Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him, for we will not sit down Till he comes here. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy with bright eyes and good looking. And the Lord said, arise and anoint for this is the one. And then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. But the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and a distressing spirit from the Lord troubled him. And Saul's servant said to him, Surely a distressing spirit from God is troubling you. Seek out a man who is a skillful player on the harp, and it shall be when he plays it with his hand that when the distressing spirit from God is upon you, that you shall be well. And from here on, we see this kind of... um, I don't know if the right word would be like a juxtaposition, but the difference between David and Saul contrasted throughout the rest of their story to where Saul 
absent from the presence of God, absent from the anointing of God, stays in this kind of perpetual distress, right, for the rest of his story. And yet David primarily resides in a place of peace and victory. So we see this this, um, correlation there that with God's presence... You have peace and victory, and apart from God's presence, you're going to experience distress. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel like I am bouncing back and forth between those two things. It amazes me sometimes how quickly I can go from feeling like I have it all figured out to feeling like everything is coming to an end And then back to the place where I think I got it all figured out again. I don't know if I'm the only one like that, but it's how I feel sometimes. Like I am just bouncing back and forth between peace and distress, victory and loss, right? And the difference is, is my, it's kind of a a proximity thing. It's how close to the Lord am I? Because in God's presence is peace and victory, our state of being is directly relative to how much we are in the presence of God. Honestly, we'll get into this in a minute, but it's not really about your circumstances. It's about your location relative to God. And what's good news about that to me is that means that it can change in an instant. I can feel like it's all going wrong. You can feel like it's all going wrong. Your circumstances don't necessarily have to change. All you have to change is coming into the presence of the Lord. And God is so faithful. He's so faithful. He gave us the the instruction, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. He's not going to hold anything against you. In the first service, Trent shared something in our first service over there at Anderson, and he talked about, it was so right on, I was wish I'm going to share it for you this time. But he talked about, you know, how good God's presence is, even in the little things. Like when you're just overwhelmed at the prospect of your day, maybe even if it's just as something as simple like as getting up and cleaning your home, but it seems overwhelming to you. He said, get into the presence of the Lord. And God will help you do that. And what you said, when you said that, you said, God isn't going to hold a grudge against you. That is literally in my notes. And that's not a common saying. I thought of it yesterday when I wrote it down. I thought, that's kind of an odd thing to say. But I think sometimes we feel like because of our failures in the past or some mistake we made, that God is going to like you know, make us jump through a bunch of hurdles to come into his presence, or God is not holding a grudge against you. His instruction is clear. Draw near to me, and I will draw near to you. Now, the very next chapter in this story with David here is the facing down of this giant Goliath, right? And, you know, you've got the situation where Israel's on one side, and the Philistines are on the other side, and there's this valley of Eli in between them. And I've been there. I've seen the place. It's actually, it's not, it's not that far apart, right? It's like this was the land of the Philistines, and this is where Israel was. But there's just this little valley in between them, and Goliath is yelling across this valley at them, taunting them every day. Now, Saul should have been able to go up and face down this giant. Had he had the presence of the Lord with him, he would have been able to do it. But he couldn't. He couldn't. And yet here comes David on the scene. This young youth. In fact, everybody's telling him he can't do it. His brother is even mocking him, Eliab. Probably bitter at having been passed over for the, for the anointing to be king. And he's like, what are you here to do? You're here to gloat. You're here to show off. You're here. And David's like, what did I ever do to you? Right? And then Saul is telling him, you can't do it. You're just a youth. Goliath has been fighting battles since he was a youth. He's been fighting battles longer than you've been alive. He's nine feet tall. He's this. He's that, right? And David's like, well, I know God's given me victories before. I killed a bear. I killed a lion. And if I 
keep my eyes on Jesus, I'm going to kill this giant in front of me. You know, it's interesting. Physically, Saul was bigger than David, right? So you would think Saul would be more capable. Saul is like head and shoulders above other men, the Bible tells us. But honestly, when you start dealing with a problem as big as Goliath, being six inches taller than the other guy isn't going to help you, right? That's like, you know, if I'm going up against Shaquille O'Neal or if whoever is, it doesn't matter, right? You're tiny. That's the case for all of us and all the problems we're facing. They just feel like they're bigger than you. Sometimes everything feels like it's bigger than me. I can be overwhelmed in an instant. Sometimes I wonder, God, why did you call me into the ministry again? (laughs) Right? I mean, sometimes it feels like the smallest thing can send me into that distress. I can get overwhelmed. I feel like all the problems are too big for me. And maybe that's why God called me. Because I know that apart from him, I'm never going to be able to stand against it. So Saul was bigger than David, but honestly, it didn't matter against that problem. What matters is is the presence of God with you. Because if God is with you, who's bigger than God? No one, nothing is bigger than God. I think that's why when Jesus taught the disciples how to pray, he instructed them to start with worship. Our Father in heaven, declaring God's fatherly love for us. And then what? Holy is your name. Just like in church, we start out with worship, right? When we start out with a bunch of talking, then we start out with worship. But you start out with worship because worship is a recognition of how big God is. And when you start to think about how big God is, God, you spoke the universe into motion. I watch these shows on nature, right, where like Nova and those other shows on Channel 9, and they start talking about things like atoms and and quarks and all these little moving parts of nuclear things. And honestly, I don't understand most of it. But what blows me away is that all of these things that we feel that are so solid seem to be comprised of things that are all moving, like atoms and protons and neutrons and all of these things. And it's like it's all moving, and yet somehow it all remains bound together And not just bound together in something that would be malleable or whatever, but it can be something solid, right? It's crazy to me. And then when you think about it, and we're made out of all that. Like, how are we held together? I don't know sometimes, you know? And it's something that's solid or at least relatively solid, right? Like, solid in places, you know? It's a miracle to me. But then not only that, God made us in such a way that not only are we held together, but we're held together in a way that supports consciousness. We're held together in a way that can learn. We're held together in a way that can heal if we get cut. It's like, God, how did you do this? You are incredible, Lord. So when you start thinking about how big God is and how awesome God is, and when you glorify God, and then you make your petition before the Lord, then you bring your problems or your your adversaries to him, it starts looking really small relative to how big God is. That's what Pastor Jack used to always tell us. He'd say, you know, put your need against the backdrop of who God is, right? And it gives you faith then to believe that God can do it. God can do it. So when I first started thinking about this message, which 
it changed yesterday, as I said. I wanted to approach it from the from this kind of point of view, like, what can God give you the victory over? But I changed it to this question for us today. What is God bigger than? What is God bigger than? Because once we see how our adversaries stack up against who God is, it gets really simple, doesn't it? I love the promise that Jesus gave the disciples before his ascension in Acts chapter 1. He said, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You shall receive power when you receive that anointing from God. You shall receive power when you have God's presence in your life in that way. You see it back with David, don't you? It's like Saul lost the anointing, he lived in distress. David got the anointing, he lived in power. He lived in peace, he lived in victory. So what is God bigger than? The first thing that we'll look at God being bigger than is people. God is bigger than people. Thinking about that event in Acts chapter Two. Okay, Acts chapter 1, God gives them the promise, tarrying Jerusalem until you be endued with power upon high. And then in Acts 1, it's, you know, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you will receive power and you shall be witnesses. And then in Acts chapter 2, you have this event of Pentecost where the Holy Spirit is poured out upon them, and they begin to speak in other tongues, and there's people from other nations there, but somehow they hear these these men glorifying God in their own languages. And it's a great miracle, and the church is born that day, and there is an empowerment. There is a person who is present for all of that event, and his name is Peter. And Peter is an interesting character, because up to this point, he has been somebody who I could... I think it's fair to say, had a fear and kind of intimidation from people. He was intimidated by them. And fear, especially of people, is usually, in large part, irrational. So, there's, like in Matthew chapter 17, the chapter starts out with the, um, the transfiguration of Jesus. Remember, they go up on the mount, and Peter and John are with Jesus, and Jesus is transfigured in their presence. We don't know exactly what that means, but something about his countenance changed before their eyes. And then Moses was standing there, and Elijah was standing there, right? Right? And Peter's all, let's build a tabernacle for all three of you. And and they're like, no, this is Jesus, right? He is the one. He has just seen that in Matthew 17, like right at the start of the chapter. And then after that is recorded like two or three more miracles of Jesus. And then they go to the temple. And Peter gets away from the Lord just for a minute And the temple tax collectors approach him and say, isn't your master going to pay the temple tax? Now he knows, Peter knows who Jesus is. He knows this is the son of the living God, right? He knows that he is the great I am. He is fully aware that this is the Messiah, But he is so intimidated by these people approaching him for these two drachmas of temple tax. He says, of course, Jesus is going to pay the tax, right? Jesus had no intention of paying that tax. Jesus doesn't need to pay a temple tax. In fact, Peter goes to him. They didn't have any coins on him. And Peter goes to him and he's like, oh, Lord, I told him you would pay temple tax. And Jesus is like, why are the own, why are us Jews having to pay a tax to our own temple? But he tells Peter, he says, nevertheless, so that we don't kind of give ourselves a bad name right now, he said, go and catch this fish. There'll be some coins in the mouth. Now, what's interesting is there wasn't just enough 
Jesus didn't just do enough to pay his own tax, but there was enough to pay Peter's as well. So Jesus is so good, but it's interesting how easily Peter was intimidated. Even after that, fully knowing who Jesus is, he's so like overcome by the questioning of a young girl that he ends up denying the Lord three times. It doesn't make any sense. He has seen Jesus raise the dead. And yet he's so intimidated by people that he will deny him or overcommit him or do anything in an instant. Fear is irrational. It's always irrational. Fear of people. Think back to Elijah's story. Elijah ends up in this showdown with the prophets of Baal. So he tells them, you build an altar and I'll build an altar And the God who answers by fire, that's the one who shall be God. So the prophets of Baal build this thing, and they're crying out all day long, and they're beating themselves, and they're cutting themselves, and Elijah's mocking him. Maybe your God's asleep. Maybe you need to yell a little bit louder, right? And then finally, when it's time, Elijah calls out on the Lord, and even though his offering had been soaked with water and everything else, God comes down and consumes the whole thing, the fire of God, right? And then Elijah not only has the miracle happen, but then he takes up a sword and goes and hacks all the prophets of Baal to pieces. This was a bad man, right? It's it's crazy to me, some of these Old Testament prophets, the things they would do. This is a guy who was full of faith. He prayed and it didn't rain for seven years, right? This is Elijah. So after he has this showdown with the prophets of Baal, fire coming down from heaven, fearless with the sword, all these things, Jezebel hears about it and says, you know what, I'm going to kill Elijah. And just her saying that freaks him out so bad, he takes off running for his life and thinks the whole world is ended. It doesn't make sense. You just called fire down from heaven, right? And this lady says, I'm going to kill you. And he's like, ah! We could get overwhelmed so quick, overcome by it. But the difference is the presence and power of God. Now, fast forward in Peter's story, Acts chapter 2 happens. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. Then we get to Acts chapter 3, and obviously something has changed in Peter. We know it immediately. Like he's going up to the temple, and there's a lame man at the gate asking for money, And Peter and John heal him, okay? Now, what's interesting to me, I just, I actually just thought of this. I think yesterday was the first time I ever thought of it. Peter is the same guy who went to the temple before, and he was so intimidated by not having money for the temple tax, he's like, of course Jesus is going to pay it. But now he's going back to the temple again. The guy asked him for money, and what does he say? Silver and gold have I none. He doesn't even have the drachmas this time for the temple tax. Interesting, huh? So he heals this guy, and people start making this this big deal about it. And in Acts 3, verse 12, it says, So when Peter saw it, he responded to the people, Men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why look so intently at us as though by our own power or godliness we made this man walk? The God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the God of our fathers. Now listen to this. And keep in mind who he's talking to here. He says he glorified, God has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. Pilate wanted to let Jesus go. But all these people in the temple here are the ones who said, no, crucify him. He goes on to say, but you denied the Holy One, the Messiah. This is the accusation he's bringing against them. You denied the Holy One and the just, and you asked for a murderer to be granted to you, and you killed the peace, the prince of life, whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. This is the same crowd 
that Peter was so afraid of that he denied the Lord. And yet now there is something that has changed in him where he can stand before those same people who had had Jesus crucified and say, you murdered your own Messiah. I mean, there's nothing worse. There's nothing more confrontational that he could say to them. And yet now he says it with power and boldness. What made the difference? The anointing of God, the presence of the Lord on his life changed everything. No longer is he walking in fear of people. It's interesting that he didn't always walk in it fully. There came another point where he was hanging out with Jewish leaders and he refused to eat with the Gentiles, even though he knew the gospel had come to the Gentiles. And that was later. And Paul had to call him out on that hypocrisy. That's comforting to me because sometimes I get afraid too. And it's when we're not totally in the presence of Jesus. But when you're in the presence of the Lord, you don't have to be afraid of people. It was the same with David. It wasn't just a Goliath against him. His brothers were against him. King Saul was against him. But God is bigger than all of them. And God is bigger than all of them in our life. So... The key to victory is not conquering people. The key is staying in God's presence. Amen? So what else is God bigger than? God is bigger than provision. God is bigger than our needs. One of the biggest fears that we seem to face is the fear of running out. That we're going to run out of money. That we're going to run out of retirement. That we're going to run out of the things we need to support our kids or bless our kids with. We have this fear of running out. I was talking to a pastor one time who, and I want to be clear about this. This is an excellent man of God, right? I would never say anything disparaging. I'm saying this is it shows how real this fear can be. Pastor is a large church making a salary well into the six figures. And we were talking about fears, and he said, my fear is not being able to support my wife. And I thought, my goodness, man. (laughs) You got it covered, okay? You're doing just fine. He's like, I know, but that fear hits me, right? Fear of running out, it's way beyond, like, how much you actually have, isn't it? Like, there are millionaires who have no peace. There are billionaires who live in fear of running out, right? So it's not even really about what you have. What we need to be is in the presence of God, because God is bigger than all of our needs. You know, we do something in the church here. We teach this class periodically. We're going to be doing it again here. Uh, we, We teach financial peace in the church. It's the Dave Ramsey course, you know, and it teaches people to get out of debt and how to save money and the envelope system and putting money away for, you know, if something breaks, emergency funds, all these things, right? And I love it. I love the freedom that we have when we don't have a bunch of debt over our head, and it really does help with financial fear. But what I always like to remind people of is it's not enough on its own. Yes, the course is named Financial Peace, but the main thing we need, too, is the financial peace that comes from Jesus. Trusting that Jesus is our provider, right? It is God who is our provider. Yes, God wants us to be wise. God, yes, He doesn't want us to be silly about going into debt and doing poor things like that. We should have a plan. But honestly, our plans always need to come second to our faith in Jesus. God is bigger than any need that we will have. Really, no matter what your station is in life. I mean, how many billionaires do we see right now whose lives are wrecked, whose marriages are wrecked, even right now as we speak? It's not enough, right? You have to have your faith in God. So it doesn't matter what your station in life is. Over and over, we see God providing for widows, and we see God providing for entire nations, right? And the key is, is that we need to stay in his presence. 
And I'll just say this in addition to that, that God isn't just faithful to provide for you, but I want you to know that God likes to provide for you. It is his joy to provide for his children. This isn't something that God does begrudgingly. This is something that God does because he loves you so much. Remember, he is our father in heaven. Imagine how much he wants to do for his kids. It's crazy how when you get into his presence, your outlook on life can change so quickly. It can change in an instance. What else is God bigger than? God is bigger than death. Each of us in this room at some point is going to face death. You say, well, Jesus could come again. Yes, he could. Jesus could come again tomorrow. And, you know, I pray for that to be the case, right? And if he does, we're all going to be caught up to meet with the Lord in the air. Amen. Jesus could come tomorrow. Jesus could come in 100 years. Jesus could come in 500 years, right? Jesus could come in 500 days. We really don't know. We know biblically that even the apostles lived in expectation of the return of Jesus, as well they should have, right? But they still all ended up going by way of the grave. And should the Lord tarry, that's how they always said it when I was a kid growing up in church, should the Lord tarry, right? Should the Lord delay his return, which he's not slack concerning his promises. If he's delaying his return, it's because he's merciful, not willing that any should perish. But should the Lord tarry, all of us will go by way of the grave. In fact, it says in Hebrews, is it is appointed for man to once die and then the judgment. There's no escaping it. So death can be an intimidating thing. Am I right? I mean, I'm only 45 right now, but I can tell you that the older I get and the more things on me just seem to break without reason, the more that I just wake up injured and don't even know how it happened while I was sleeping, the more that these things happen where stuff just hurts and I don't know why, right? You start to become aware of it, that it's like, I'm not going to go on forever, And you start to live with more and more of a consciousness of that, that it's like, okay, this is not, and death can be kind of a hard thing for us to face unless you are residing in the presence of God. God is bigger than death. In fact, Jesus is so much bigger than death, death couldn't hold him. Death couldn't even keep him in the grave. So when we are residing in the presence of Jesus, the outlook on our future and our eternity starts to look altogether different. In fact, when you spend enough time in the presence of God, it actually doesn't sound that bad. Even Paul said, right, um, it would be better for me to go right now and be with the Lord. But he said at the time, but it's more profitable for you if I stay. It's like he still had work to do. Now, I'm not there yet, right? I'm still ready to stay here and be with my family and be with my friends. But I don't want to live in fear of it. I don't want to live in fear of it because God is bigger than death. Staying close to God through studying his word, through prayer, through not forsaking the gathering of yourselves together like you're doing today, staying close to God when you are abiding him, or let me get this right here, staying close to God will keep you full of faith and hope until you are residing eternally in his love. Amen. I want to say that again. Staying close to God will keep you full of faith and hope until you are residing eternally in his love. And I use those three things there intentionally, faith, hope, and love. And I know it's a familiar teaching to you out of 1 Corinthians 13, but I'll just remind you of this. Paul taught us, now abides three things, faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. Why? Because faith and hope are temporary. There's going to come a day where you don't need them anymore. 
when you are dwelling directly in the presence of God eternally, right, then you're not going to have to believe in him by faith anymore. No longer are you going to be believing in a God who you can't see. You're going to be standing face to face with him. And faith isn't needed anymore. I'm not going to need to hope anymore for eternity because I'm going to be in eternity. I won't need hope anymore because everything I've hoped for at that point is fulfilled, right? So that's why I'm saying right now, staying close to God in his presence will keep you full of faith and hope until you are residing eternally in his love. God is bigger than death. What is the last thing I'll look at right now that God is bigger than? And that is this. God is bigger than you are. God is bigger than you. Your flesh can seem like an insurmountable foe. And I suppose, apart from God, it is. Lust is a killer. And I don't mean just lust for sexual things. I mean just lusting for anything that is outside of God's desired plan for your life right? Lust is a killer. And apart from God, it can feel like it is an overwhelming thing to you. Your ego is a killer. How many marriages are destroyed by ego? Where people just end up in this standoff against each other. I'm not going to change unless they change. Well, I'm not going to change unless they change. Oh, they disrespected me. Oh, this and that, right? And it's like this ego thing and ends up wrecking a marriage or wrecking a friendship. How many friendships have been wrecked by ego because somebody offended the other person? And because of it, it was destroyed. How many jobs have been lost because of ego? Oh, they don't appreciate me enough. Oh, I didn't get the promotion that I thought I deserved. Oh, I didn't get the size of raise that I thought I deserved. And you end up wrecking your job because of it. Ego. God is bigger than your ego. And when you start to stack your ego up against who God is, you should get humble in a hurry. God is bigger than you. God is bigger than your flesh. God is bigger than your, your anger problem. People, you know, they'll tell me sometimes, I got an anger problem. Sometimes I wonder, do you really got an anger problem, right? Like, I've had anger issues, believe it or not. I know that's hard for you to believe. I've had major anger issues. You know what? There are times when I still have major anger issues, I don't know if you've ever had an anger problem where you're literally afraid of your own temper. Because when people say like they lose their temper, but have you ever lost it to where you really just literally lost control, right? That's anger. But when you stack your anger up against who God is, it gets small in a hurry. You know what I'm saying? Like these things we struggle with, when you're staying in the presence of the Lord, it just pales in comparison to who he is. And it becomes a lot different. The offenses get very small. It's like, oh, I'm going to be offended about that. Think about who God is. Imagine if God got offended all the time. Oh, my goodness. We'd be in trouble, <laughs> right? I'm offensive. If I were offending God all the time, oh my goodness, I'm going to give you the cold shoulder, you know? It would be bad. God is bigger than we are. So, um, when you are abiding in him, the parts of you that are too big for you start to seem very small. So, in closing, I'll just say this. God's presence in our life, it is the difference between living in distress or living in victory. We see that. We see that in the Old Testament examples of Saul and David, but we see it all throughout Scripture. We see it in our own lives. When we are in the presence of God, it makes all the difference. It makes all the difference. You just have to draw near to him. 
and here's where I put that note, he's so faithful, he doesn't hold grudges, he's not going to reject you, and this is the cool thing to me, the change from distress to victory is only a moment away. It only takes a moment to enter into God's presence. Your peace isn't contingent on everything that's giving you a problem going away. Your peace and victory do not have to wait for that to happen. It happens when you get into the presence of God. Amen? Amen. He changes everything. Father, I just want to take a moment, God, for you to speak into the hearts of your children this morning. That God, whatever it is that may have been feeling too big for us, that may have been bringing distress on us, God, that has been that, Lord, we would begin to cast that against who you are. And not only that, God, it doesn't matter if those things are too big for us. God, they're not too big for you. And when we are with you, when we are in your presence, Lord, who should we be afraid of? No one. What should we be afraid of? Nothing. There's nothing, Lord. God, we thank you for being so good, Lord. For loving us even when we mess up, God. For your grace and your compassion for us. That again and again and again you pick us up, God. And you hold us close to you. And God, when we are with you like that, we don't have to be afraid, God. You have this, Lord. You have our lives. You have our families. You have our church. You have our nation, God. You've got this, Lord. You've got it. We just want to be in your presence, God, knowing that you have a plan for it all. You've got this, Lord. We thank you for, for just, God, how amazing you are. How vast you are, God. Like David said, Lord, there's nowhere we could go to escape from your presence. There's nowhere we could go, God. Wherever we would go, you would be there, Lord. We praise you for that, God. Because wherever we go, we'll have the victory in Jesus' name. I thank you for this, Lord. I thank you, God, for this church this morning. Just how awesome it has been to be together worshiping you, Lord. I pray, God, that you would bless each and every person here, those who watched online, God, those who will be watching throughout the rest of this week, Lord, when, when they get off work or whatever, Lord. We just pray, God, that you would bless them, Jesus. Change their outlook, Lord, I pray in your mighty name. Amen. Amen. God bless you, church.